All right, so this is a continuation of uh, section 8.1, and it's going to be a very short, actually, lecture. Uh, in it, we're going to introduce the concept of primitive proof of uh, an integer mod n, or what we call uh, just a primitive root of n. All right, here is the definition. Let uh, a be any integer and n bigger than one be relatively prime if it happens that the order mod n of a is the largest p of n, then we call a a primitive root mod n. Or simply, we say A is a primitive group of uh, N. So we don't have to uh, refer back to mod N. All right, now uh, let's. Uh, Write it from scratch means that it A is a primitive root of M if A to the P of M is congruent to one mod n and a to the k is not congruent to one mod n for any positive integer k less than p. So for those of you who are familiar with the concept of the primitive root uh, of unity, okay, in complex numbers, this is pretty much what that means, all right? It is a kind of a complex number that satisfies a similar uh, property. All right, so that's why we sometimes actually speak it this way. Let's look at uh, some examples. Actually, we already seen some. So the concept of primitive root is really not something totally different. The, the order, it is just saying that, uh, you know, an A is a primitive root if it has order P of N. And of course, P is order uh, P of N. All right? So we're going to look at some examples. So if we look at that, done this. The order of the three odd seven, which happens to be six, and this is six, of course, is three of seven. This means that three is a primitive root. of uh, seven. Another primitive root of seven is A is five is also another uh, primitive root of seven. And these are the only one. Okay, there is no other 
primitive roots. Remember the, you know, when we talk about order, primitive roots in, in particular, we're looking for those integers that are relatively prime, all right, to uh, seven, all right? And you have the number from one till uh, six that they are, and then among these, these uh, three and five, but then, uh, the, you know, the other ones, four, two, and so on, but these are not permanent. So these are the only ones. And here's another example. It turns out not all integers actually have primitive roots. For example, n equal a has no primitive roots. And uh, to, to, to see this, first of all, the uh, integers that are relatively prime, that are relatively prime, uh, to a, and this value equal to a, are One, three, five, and seven. And we look at the order of these. Of course, the order of one is always one for any integer. And the order of the mod eight here, mod eight of the three. This, uh, in fact, is equal to 2, because uh, 3 squared is 9, congruent 1, mod 8, yes. And the order of 5 is uh, also 2, 25, congruent 1, mod 8, yes. And uh, 7 also is but P of A is equal to 4, and none of these is actually has order 4. In fact, in the next two sections, section 8.2 and 8.3, we're going to determine all the integers that have primitive roots. In section 8.2, we're going to show that every prime has a primitive root, and in section 8.3, we're going to get the other number primes that are actually they have primitive roots. As a matter of fact, the uh, numbers or the integers that they have primitive roots are very limited. There are not very many. There are infinitely many of them. For example, every prime is has a primitive root, and, and there are infinitely many primes. And then, of course, the uh, there are more than just just the prime number. But in other words, the, uh, they are very few compared with all the integers, okay, all the positive integers. All right, uh, the next term we're going to show the significance of the uh, primitive roots. Uh, for one thing, they're going to provide us with uh, supplies with reduced residue system on integers. It's a tool we could use. And then there are, of course, other uses of primitive roots that we will be studying uh, in the remaining section of chapter 10. All right, so this is the main theorem concerning primitive roots, uh, at least in this section. This is 8.4. And we're going to start with uh, the uh, a and N be relatively prime. And we're going to let A1, A2, up to 
a t over n be positive integers. And uh, these are less than, or these are less than n, and relatively prime.
So then it means that all these powers are congruent, uh, are relatively prime to n. So this is the fifth one. Second one needs to show that a to the i is not congruent a to the j for every i does not equal to j between 1 and p of n. All right? And uh, to do this, let's assume by contradiction, So let's assume that a to the i is congruent to a to the j on n uh, for some i but not equal to j. But not equal to j between, of course, 1 and t of n. And, uh, But what does this mean? And now we have by theorem a point uh, is point two since a i at least we are assuming is equivalent to a sub j on n. This implies i is equivalent to j mod the order of a, uh, of a, in this case, and this is P of n. Well, that in itself implies that P of n divides i minus j, and this makes uh, P of n less than or equal i minus j. But we have but i and j, they are less than or equal p of n, and both together are equal to 1. This implies the difference between them. And let's assume that the i is bigger. So the i minus j is going to be actually less than uh, p of n. All right, is that, yeah, it's going to be actually this and uh, u n in bigger than or equal to one. Well, this only happens actually, uh, this implies that i minus j must be equal to zero, and this implies that i is equal to j. And this is a contradiction because we are assuming that these are not congruent, that uh, these are not equal to actually each other. All right? All right. So, the, uh, so this shows that uh, the powers of A are form a reduced residue system. So therefore, the conclusion we get from this argument, therefore, A is uh, A P of N is a reduced as it is system model. Now what's left, we're going to show that, we need to show, given uh, one of these, given A to the I, okay, in this set, we need to show Or need to find, need to. Or let me say to show. 
too many to show, but having it here, A to the I is congruent to A sub J for some J between one and field. So once we have this, it means that, that each one of these is going to be congruent to uh, uh, a subject, all right? Yeah, of course, the congruence is going to be exactly with, with one. All right? And to do this, again, we use the same argument before. We're going to use the uh, division algorithm. So by the division algorithm, we're going to express A to the J as Q sub J uh, multiplied by N plus R sub J, where the R sub J is the remainder, going to be bigger than or equal to zero, this then N. Alright, now let's take a, a to the j, and substitute for the j by what is equal to, we're going to consider this, a to the j, is congruent, uh, sorry, this one is, uh, let me see it. Right, right. Uh, now, because uh, we have uh, A to the J is going to be congruent to R to the J, all right, mod N, because if we do actually, this is mod N, let me actually write it in, in detail. So this one is Q sub J N plus R sub J. If we do a congruence mod N, we get this. All right, and since R sub J is between zero and less than N, And greatest common divisor of A to the J and N would be also the same as the greatest common divisor of any number that is congruent to it, which is R sub J and equal to 1. So these two facts that the greatest common divisor of R to J uh, and n is 1, and the R sub j is between 0 and n. This implies that R j is going to be equal to A sub j for sum j between 1 and that P of n. But we have, of course, the A sub J here is congruent to R sub J, and this is congruent to A sub J uh, mod N, and this is exactly what we want to show. All right. There is a correlation to this there, which we already approved uh, when we did the uh, 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 do the second corollary to theorem 8.3. So I just going to put it here for reference. We already proved this in a much simpler way. This is a corollary. This is actually corollary to, to theorem. We proved it after theorem 8.3. All right? So it says that uh, if 
n has a primitive root then it has exactly T of field N primitive uh, roots. So in other words, the total count of the primitive ones N has a primitive root, then it has an extra phi of phi of, uh, of N minus one, right? the original one primitive roots, or the total number of primitive roots is going to be phi of phi of N. So we already have proof there, so I'm not going to uh, redo the proof again. All right, uh, one last thing, uh, there is one example given in the middle somewhere. I, I have to spoil it till now, probably it's a uh, natural place for it in here, is uh, concerning Fermat uh, numbers. And here it is. So this is an example. And please, we're going to, let's consider the Fermat number. Uh, remember that this is denoted by f sub n and is equal to to the power 2 to the power n plus 1. And the n is bigger than or equal to 1. Now, Fairbath conjecture that uh, any number of this form is a prime. And he did calculation for f1, f2 up to f4, and he made the conjecture but he did not support a proof. And uh, later on, Euler came and calculated F5, and turns out that F5 is actually composite. It is not known whether there are infinitely many or finitely many uh, Fermat primes. Any number of this form, if it's a prime, is called Fermat prime. All right? Uh, however, there are some, there are Primes and others are composite, but in general, no, we nobody knows if there are infinitely uh, at least uh, Fermat uh, primes. They are called Fermat primes. However, if, if it happens that uh, if n is in fact a prime, then uh, for n bigger than or equal to two, then uh, two is not a primitive root of uh, the Fermat prime number. In, in the next section, as I said, we're going to show that every prime has primitive roots, but not every number has a primitive root, of course. There are some numbers, at least, does have some primitive roots. All right? So, uh, so this is what we're going to show in here. And uh, first of all, let's look at F1. We're going to see that So this is equal to five. Uh, so this is a prime, of course. And uh, two is a primitive root. Of F1, which is equal to five. And this is very simple to show. All that you have to do is to look at uh, two to the one. It's not going to root to one mod five. Uh, two squared. This is equal to four, not going to root to one mod five. Two to the third is eight. And again, this is not going to root to one mod five. Two to the fourth is uh, equals 16, and this is congruent to uh, 1 mod 5, 
and we have t of 5 is equal to 4, equal to 4, and this implies, and this implies that uh, 2 is a primitive root, is a primitive root of 5. But this is the only prime, this is the only Fermat prime that has two as a primitive group. Yeah, we're gonna show, and this is the claim. And this is the claim. F, F of N is a prime and again in the next section we're going to show that every prime has primitive roots but in this case if this one is a prime then two is not a primitive root of of Fn, okay, for this problem. And uh, to show this, we're going to look at, uh, let's consider this uh, expression, 2 to the power 2 n plus 1, minus 1. I claim this is equal, which you can check, 2 to the, 2 to the n, times 2 to the 2 to the n minus. By just multiplying this out, you're going to see that uh, so this will give you 2 to the 2 n plus 1, and then these cancel out, and you end up with minus 1. And remember, this one is, then this is f sub n times 2 to the 2 to the n minus 1 which means that f sub n divides uh, the 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1, all right, minus 1. And also we can conclude out of this congruence, we could write this one as 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 is congruent to 1 mod f. So at least I know that in the order of 2, well, if n is going to be smaller than or equal to this. Then we're going to calculate what is phi of uh, phi of n is. All right, so that also implies that the order mod f of n of 2 is going to be smaller than or equal to 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1. Right. All right. Now, uh, if, if n is a prime, We have p of f sub n is going to be f sub n minus 1. But f sub n is equal to 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1 minus 1. And this gives you 2 to the 2 to the n, like this. Now, it's not very hard to see that uh, there is a claim 2 to the 2 to the uh, actually just the, uh, the exponent uh, let me see in fact uh, this one I'm, this is I'm goofing at this this one is supposed to be 2 to the n plus 1 sorry 
this is the uh, order of two. So when we raise that to the to this exponent, we come up with one. So the order of this is this. Now the clear air, which is not very hard to, to prove, two to the n plus one is bigger than, of course, two to the n. And if you want, you could prove this is by induction, or actually this is uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, what I'm saying in here. I wanted to say that uh, the V of Fn is equal to 2 to the 2 to the n is in fact uh, bigger than 2 to the n plus 1. For every n bigger than or equal, uh, bigger than 1. And this you can do by induction. So I'm going to leave this for you as an exercise. All right. It's kind of a, you know, it should be true because this is double exponentiation and this is, uh, we know that exponentially grow very, very fast. So it is very uh, reasonable to accept. All right. Uh, with this, then what do we have in here? We have the order of 2 mod f sub n, which is actually, we are saying that this one is less than or equal to 2 to the n plus 1. All right? And this one is less than 2 to the 2 to the n, which is phi of f sub n. So in other words, the order of s strictly is going to be less than, it's going to be strictly less than 2 to the 2 to the n, which is again p of f n, which means cannot equal to, and this implies that 2 is not a primitive root Uh, of f n. F n. All right. I uh, think this is it. Just gonna stop right here. We check. There's anything else? Yeah, that's it. All right. Uh, so I'm gonna stop right here.